Continuing eastward, I once again came to the wall, turned left northward, took a few steps eastward to the base of the incline to the top of the wall, and then climbed southward a few dozen yards. I sat after taking off my backpack and arranged my blanket to block some of the sunlight. One corner draped over my backpack, another corner draped over me. Cranking the radio's dynamo a few more minutes, I gazed eastward at Valjean Valley and the Kingston Mountain Range. Like a herd of buffalo, small puffs of black clouds came drifting slowly into the region. Meeting the updraft caused by the Kingston Mountains, the cloud children seemed to pause a bit as if confused about where to go, then lifted in altitude another 800 feet or so. Caught in a thermal-powered back eddy, the clouds drifted in the direction they had just come. At the higher altitude, the little clouds bunched up as if gathered by unseen cowboys, blotting out the sky until large sections of Valjean Valley and the eastern mountains were in shadow. More clouds at lower altitude drifted in. Tuning my radio to the FM band, I found a radio station with a repeater at Mountain Pass. Laying on my back, pulling the edge of my shade blanket down to just above my eyebrows, I watched the valley grow darker. Over the radio, the disc jockey, way over there in Laughlin, Nevada, was asking people to call in for music requests. It was a country western music station, so I yelled out, Play some more Led Zeppelin. Instead, someone asked for Clint Black's song, Where Are You Now? A fine song for anyone who has not been living alone and lonely in the desolate, desolate wilderness for the past 11 months. I thought about some of the women I had known. Where the hell did they all go? Why did they all leave me here in this desert, on this mountain range, laying here alone on this rock? As the day grew darker, with the sky being slowly blotted out with dark clouds, I thought about Catherine. She used to ride around with me in the evening as we went grocery shopping, or visited some social event, or traveled to and from the Harlequin Playhouse while we were dressed up in thousand-dollar outfits. She once told me that she would be happy and content if all she ever did the rest of her life was to ride around with me in my pickup, going towards or away some destination. It didn't matter which or where. Where the bloody hell was she now? Women are, on the whole, smart and, and intelligent beings, too smart to squander their limited time here on the planet with the likes of me. The women I knew all went and found men to share their lives with, recognizing me as the boy I was, am, and always will be. If a human male wants a woman in his life, he needs to become an adult, something I could never do. There is no secret regarding how to be a real man in the modern world. It's the same it's always been. Meet all of your responsibilities without complaining. Far too often I have fallen short in that regard. Too many times I didn't even try, taking the easier routes through life. The request hour ended, mercifully, with trite and odious musical pabulum being axed for and served up. If they had started to play Paul Stuckey's The Wedding Song, I vowed, I would slice open my wrist, then my throat. Mercifully, the DJ started to play the entire This Song Remembers When CD from Trisha Yearwood. Slowly, imperceptibly, out there in the valley, the lower cloud layer rose upward and the upper layer descended. The cloud layers met and an inner turmoil in the sky, matching the fermenting emotional unrest within me, induced tiny bells of dark rain to fall. The falling rain came in discreet packets, leisurely, in no hurry to reach the ground, and the thirsty desert denzines below. Like water from a garden hose with a sprinkler head on the end, bits of the blackened sky shed log curtains of black water earthward over there near Ibex Pass, then over there on Tacopa Pass, then a little on Kingston Peak. A bit of rain here and there, not too much in any one spot. The music continued as it progressed into evening, and the pockets of rain continued to bless tiny sections of the desert. Crackling blasts from lightning somewhere visited my radio, overwhelming for brief moments the radio station, lightning too distant or hidden from, my, from me to see what direction from which it came. Some of the day's heat slowly leached away, and I yanked at my blanket and wrapped it around me, 
I slept, head on my backpack. I awoke to the sound of hissing near me. Looking up in the evening gloom, I saw rain falling a few hundred feet from me. Where the rain fell was a maelstrom of sand and bits of grass, plant leaves and twigs jumping a few centimeters into the air. It looked like the ground was boiling, churning, heaving from some force under the earth. Hey, I said in a low, soothing, and what I hoped was an enticing voice. Come over here, gorgeous wet stuff. The rain, sweeping southeastward, ignored me and soon passed me by. The hissing faded as the evening grew, matured, aged into darkness. I pulled my blanket tighter around my arms and neck. The scant rain, which had avoided me in a manner I could only think of as disdainfully, did not return that night, for, nor for another six months. My radio had fallen silent, exhausted. I cranked the handle a few minutes, and the music returned, a great return on my caloric investment. No moonlight filtered through the cloudy sky, and the thought of returning to my sleeping place in front of my cave was an unpleasant thought. Many dozens of hazards lay in wait for me in the dark. No matter, the late spring nights were not oppressively chilly, and the rock I was laying on could be endured. The heat punched me in the face like an irate father. Hell, I was used to that, so I pressed on to my pickup, sack of burritos in my good hand, and looked inside to see if anyone had stolen anything, such as my backpack. All was well, so I walked over to the large battered trash bin to squat in its shade and eat. Next to the trash bin was a very tiny car in roughly the shape of an armadillo. Its front end hovered a few inches above the pavement, and its ass end did the same. The car's body was like half a wheel of cheese, a semi-circle disc with a door on the left and right surfaces, and a windshield sloping sharply like a fishbowl in front. The whole thing crouched low to the ground like an abused and battered dog. I felt sorry for it. I also felt sorry for the massive, quivering, gelatinous, obese man who was standing next to that car. I stopped feeling sorry for him when all 0.141 metric ton of him saw me and started walking my way, his eye sockets embedded deeply in a sea of fat. The sound of labored panting and gurgling got closer and my viscera rose throatward and threatened to strangle me as the heat-shrouded apparition came thitherward. Warily I got to my feet and stepped away from the trash bin so that my escape route was less hindered. I stepped a few feet to the left, and the walking flesh changed its vector to intercept me. I stepped a few feet to the right, and the heaving mound once again changed its vector. I stood my ground and let it come at me. A rill of fear wended through me as it got closer. I wish I had a CO2 fire extinguisher to fight it with, like Steve McQueen in the movie, The Blob. With my injured hand, I patted the left pocket of my pants, and I felt the tactical defense ballpoint pin within. I had foolishly left my tactical defense belt knife in the glove box of my car, though at the moment I wish I had a tactical defense pistol, or perhaps a tactical defense harpoon. Even a tactical defense stick would have been welcomed. Though the Leviathan spoke with a gurgle. Good morning, have you praised the Lord today? I knew the answer to that question immediately. Well, no, I have not. I live here in the United States. We don't have lords here. We don't do feudalism here. Perhaps you're thinking of the United Kingdom. The two deep pits where the eyes presumably were closed briefly, then opened again, a double blink. I assumed. No, he blurbled. I mean the Lord God Almighty, your Father in Heaven. Well, thank you, but my name is not Almighty, and dude, my father ain't up there, and I wager never will be. You must never have met him. The dual eye pits on his face closed and opened again. He tried a different approach, though for the life of me I could not guess why he was annoying me. Nor could I guess why I was not walking away. Perhaps he wanted my burritos. Perhaps I wanted to see how long he could keep standing hatless under the harsh, torturous, unrelenting sun, 
as the temperature was well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What brings you to Baker? he asked. There was a time when it was surprising to me just how rude some complete strangers are. It would never occur to me to walk up to someone I don't know and speak to the stranger, unless that person appeared to need help or if I needed help. More to the point, I would never walk up to a stranger and start asking personal questions why she or he was standing in Baker talking to a rude person. I'm working a turquoise claim in the hills over there, I lied, gesturing to the north. I thought about lecturing him on how to be polite to strangers, that is, he should ignore them. But lecturing adults about being polite when they need the lecture is not polite. A fucking conundrum. Americans ceased being polite in the late 1500s. Shits, I've encountered strangers who insisted I shake their hand, which I find overly repugnant, as if it was normal to just seize some stranger for a few seconds. And don't even get me started on the strangers who insist they have the right to hug me. Oh, he said, finding a new route to brainwash me with. You've created, Marga, great flood of Noah. The way he spoke, the words must have been all in upper case in his head thing. <clears throat> Shit, I had an answer rehearsed for that also. I've no idea who or what that is. Do you mean the great flood of Unatishapam? I could speak in all upper case, too. Who which? he asked. No, no, um, no, he blurbled and gurgled, trying to keep up. And he interrupted me before I could tell him the real true story and convince him to start worshipping Enki and the other Sumerian gods. But I vowed to get it in there somehow later. The flood, the only flood, well, not the only flood. I mean, the only, the one, the great one. That's what I said, I said. The Sumerian god Enki rescued humanity and all other life forms on Earth by warning Utnapishtim. Eventually, Babylonian incorporated the Sumerian story into its cosmology. During the captivity of the elites in ancient Israel, the Hebrews incorporated the Babylonian version into their cosmology and gave us Noah. I was not only educating him, I was punishing him for his rudeness by inducing painful dissonance in his head. He closed one eye pit as he pondered what I said, and left the other open to keep a wary watch on me. Both eye pits opened again, and the rubbery lips parted in a happy smile as he turned to look to my right, and so did I. Coming towards us was what I think was a woman. Her 0 0.163 metric ton was situated above two large feet, clad in massive tennis shoes. Above the shoes, about ten inches, her cylinder-shaped upper body started and continued for about four feet until there was a head. Two massive arms held several cardboard trays stacked to the top of each other, and each tray appeared burdened with paper-wrapped burritos, hamburgers, deep-fried potatoes, and other American health food. I greeted her, and she returned the greeting with a smile. The man fished into a tray and retrieved a burrito and unwrapped it. Then, giving me a stare to make sure I was watching, I was trying not to, but couldn't help myself, he forced his chin bone deep into his chest fat, stared intently at the burrito in his palm, and started to yell at it. Dear Lord, thank you for nourishment and all the other gifts you have graced us with today. We are so grateful of... Your Lord is a burrito, I asked. Dude, you're talking to a burrito. I was trying to be helpful again. Your dispensation in loving your sinful children in this time of great iniquity. We also thank you for... And if you want the burrito to answer, maybe you need to shout at it a little louder because beans ain't got any ears, I suggested. Thunder of needful child! He looked from his lord of beans, cheese, tortilla, and hot sauce and glanced at me, then turned his head back to address the burrito again. To come to help him, set him on the path of... Back to your love and graces, I humbly ask. Does your lord need any salt? I have some packets of salt here. 
Maybe you could do what I do and stuff your lord with french fries. His companion, if I could read what passed for her face correctly, looked confused. Religion is the fashionable alternative to thinking. I learned early in life that it is fun to tease people, early as in before conception. I once made a hamburger for someone who had excessive compulsive disorder using two bun bottoms for him and the two tops for me just to see what would happen. I hid the kitchen knives first. One early morning I told a co-worker with OCD, I never tell the truth and then let him stew in that infinitely aggressive, unpardonable statement for the rest of the day. I tuned him out so that I no longer heard what he was saying. We stood there, me besmirching my lunch and he beseeching his. When I finished eating, I interrupted him and said, I beg your pardon, but I'm still hungry. I'm going to go buy another lord or two. Thank you and drive safely. I walked away, fearing I would be followed, and I went inside the burrito store to hide from them. I didn't want any more food, so I just sat at the table next to the window, and I watched them, which is not polite, waiting for them to drive away. They stood in the sun eating after placing the cardboard trays of food on the top of their odd vehicle. Eventually the mill was finished, and they put their trash in the trash bin, and then they engineered themselves into their tiny car. It was very much an engineering feat. The man went to the passenger side and opened the tiny door. And with his feet still on the pavement, he stuffed his head and upper body into the tiny space inside the car. The car lurched sideways as it took his weight, but only dropped about two inches. The vehicle had no shock absorbers. He then shoved his head hard against the feet. No, I'm sorry. He then shoved hard against his feet to force as much of his lower body into the car as he could, and then pivoted his mass leftward on his massive left ass cheek and drew his left leg inside. The sh car shook violently. The right leg then followed the left twin. Once he was in, the maybe woman performed similar maneuvers but in a mirror image. It was like watching two giant squid oozing themselves into one tiny mustard jar. I was glad I ate first before seeing that. 